And now for something completely different. Uh, because um, childhood undernutrition leads to a lifetime of negative consequences, uh, it's often used as an indicator of poverty or household welfare. Uh, what I propose to do today is to look at a particular um, indicator which I think is important because it's under discussion for inclusion in the next round of MDG goals. So let me go. Whoops. Ah, okay. Um, what got me started on this was I was looking at in Zimbabwe in the early 80s the effects on household welfare of redistributing land to near landless households. Um, I've got what I think, I haven't been contradicted yet, is the longest panel study in Africa um, of a group of land reform beneficiaries and non beneficiaries, four to six hundred households a year across three different agroecological zones. And I've used a, a broad mix of both conventional indicators and non-monometric non ones, principally indicators related to health and nutrition. Um, to cut to the chase, what, what I found over time as I've looked in more and more detail at these is a, a paradox. There's an average decline in nutritional welfare of 1.4% a year over two decades. No matter what happens with rainfall, with income, what have you. Um, this same trend is indicated by the, the, um, the first acronym is the Zimbabwe Rural Household Dynamics Study and then the second is the Zimbabwe Demographic and Health Surveys. Um, so the panel study, you, you look at the two trend lines, um, a panel study pretty closely matches what's indicated by a large-scale random national survey uh, done at periodic intervals. Um, so the, the probability of, of a household being undernourished at the end of two decades is 25% higher than at the beginning. So I was pu very puzzled by this, um, which led me to play around with some development economic concepts. One was to look at these outcomes on a household basis. And I considered the, the nutritional status of both adults and children. Um, and this takes over a five-year period, just for illustration. Um, a household is symptomatic if undernutrition exists. And this is below two standard uh, deviations for children and below a, a body mass index of 18.5 for adults. So what you have here is an indication 16 plus percent of households have undernutrition both among adults and children. Now, as a development economist, you may think, okay, this is, that's clearly perhaps a poor group, a group that needs attention. Um, on the other hand, you've got a, almost a third of households have no symptoms of undernutrition. You might think, okay, this, this group of households is pretty well off. We don't have to worry too much about poverty. Um, what is interesting, though, is the difference in these verticals. You've got 63% um, of children are undernourished and 21% of adults. So there are things going on here that, that um, looking at things from a household perspective, conceal uh, perhaps more than they reveal. Um, so the nutritional assessments, I suggest, aren't particularly helpful. Um, one reason is if you've got 60% of children who are undernourished, that, that is the norm. So the other welfare indicators you might look at don't tell you very much when you've got that norm. Um, I've referred already to the, the contradictory outcomes. Um, income, food production, food purchases, none of these fits very well with patterns of of undernutrition. Um, part of this may relate to the approach I've taken in this particular analysis is 
looking at simply at a presence or absence of undernutrition using dummies. Um, it may be, and with the thresholds, it may be that it's the depth of deprivation that's more important than the presence or absence. Um, and I can't answer that question at the moment. And then finally, it doesn't work at a household level because the cause and effect relationships for undernutrition among adults and children are very different. Um, adults uh, typically, I should add, data are always collected in what's considered the hunger season. Uh, this is the period of when uh, acute agricultural activity and declining food supplies. So it, it should be pretty good at detecting nutritional stress. Um, this, I think, is, is a critically important one. I'd like, particularly like to draw your attention to uh, what's going on here. There, this is based on over 7,000 observations. Uh, chronic undernutrition, the blue line, height for age, and acute uh, undernutrition, the red line, weight for age. Um, what is, what's interesting about this is the uh, periodicity. Two recent sets of articles in The Lancet, and I've, I've read over, I'm changing professions, I think I've read over 100 medical papers to do this, um, suggest that the critical period or child growth is the first thousand days of life, from conception to the second birthday. That's when it really all happens. So we're talking about, you've got nine months back this way, and then you've got down to this period. Now what is very striking is that all of these children are, are born, spend the first few months of their lives above the values that you would expect, above that zero. But at the age of about six months, there's a precipitous decline. Um, a number of things are going on here. One is it begins to be, it's the age when children begin to be fed solid foods. So they're not exclusively breastfed. The other thing that begins to happen, and I'll, I'll elaborate this in a moment, is it's the age when mothers begin to put their children on the floor. And children explore their worlds by putting pieces of it in their mouths. I'll come back, I'll come back to that as I said. Um, so that's why that, that age is critical. Now what's going on here um, is something that development economists have missed and the medical profession has known about for 50 years but didn't appreciate the significance of. This is a phenomenon known as environmental enteropathy, formerly known as tropical enteropathy, and it's universal among people living in unhygienic conditions. Um, now, my, bear in mind, my households are entirely rural households. You do not find this condition um, to anywhere near the extent among urban households. So it's a pretty much a rural phenomenon. The etiology is unclear. Uh, doctors think it's uh, due to, as I said, unhygienic conditions, um, often simplified to fecal oral contamination. No hand washing, no toilets, um, but then it's also been implicated to uh, dirty water supplies. It's also associated with living in very close proximity to animals. It occurs among pastoralists, um, uh, periodic wanderers, and residential households as well. So it, it is pretty universal. Um, and it underlies um, the, the death of, uh, of half of the under, under well, under, half of under five deaths. Okay. Um, now, for a typographic that you seldom see in, in a wider conference, if ever, um, just to give you some idea of the mechanism involved, you know, uh, this, the, the human digestive tract is about nine meters long in adults. Six to seven meters of this length is the small intestine. That's where the, the real work is done. The stomach absorbs some sugar, the large intestine absorbs some protein. But the real work of absorption is done in the small intestine. Now, on the interior of the small intestine, a closer v view, you have these little finger-like projections called villi. And you can see at this level of magnification, looking more closely, um, you've got healthy villi looking like this. 
these, these great folds with the finger-like projections. Uh, the importance of these things is that the absorptive area um, in, in the human gut, a healthy human gut, is ten times, more than ten times the area of human skin. It's a huge area. Two things are going on here. These villi absorb nutrients into the, into the bloodstream. At the base here, you have a set of glands. These are basically glands that feed enzymes into, back into the gut and assist in digestion. There's a, another factor that's important, and that is this membrane. The, the gut um, normally is, um, is not easily soluble, and it's filled with toxins. Now, these are healthy. Let's go to a different perspective. Here, you've got the same healthy villi here. You've got two, two parts of it, the crypt the, at the base and the villi themselves. The ratio is normally in a healthy uh, body is two to one. These are villi affected by environmental enteropathy. What's happening is you have excessive production of cells. The cells coat the, uh, the villi and reduce the absorptive capacity. Um, the other thing that's going on that you can't see is that the uh, glands that assist in uh, digestion can't get their juices into the gut. But there's a third point that's, that's going on here is that this barrier becomes permeable. So toxins are leaking from the gut into the bloodstream. Um, now, in the terms that medical anthropologists use, um, environmental enteropathy is an invisible disease. But the medical anthropologists usually refer to medical invisible diseases as diseases in which I know I'm suffering from something, but I can't persuade anyone else, my parents or my doctor, to believe that I'm suffering. Uh, EE is invisible in every dimension. The sufferer does not know that he or she has any, um, any condition. The carers do not know that those they care for have a medical condition because uh, with stunting under nutrition as the norm, my children look the same as everybody else's children. So we don't see a difference. There's no, you, not easy to detect. The medical profession cannot diagnose environmental enteropathy. Um, and they don't know who's suffering. And then worse, the effects of environmental enteropathy are largely irreversible. Um, there is, uh, there may be a modest catch-up effect, but it's not significant. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, if it's subclinical, which it is, how do you then spot it? Well, medical researchers use the most common gold standard test is what's called the uh, LM test, which is uh, to administer two different sugars to um, uh, someone who's suffering from EE, and the, the sugars one sugar leaks out into the bloodstream and the other uh, goes uh, into, uh, may or may not go into um, the, uh, uh, the large intestine. But it's the, um, it's the ratio of these two sugars that determines what's, uh, whether you got it or not. So essentially, you're, you create, you, EE creates addition where malabsorption of nutrients uh, reduces the resources during critical periods of growth. Um, I should go back to that, uh, the diagram, if you remember the retardation of growth. Something that's really not appreciated terribly well. Um, I've done work with Harold Alderman at the World Bank and John Hodnot at IFPRI looking at the, the outcomes of poor, poor nutrition on the particularly on educational performance, you get, you get late entry into school, you get poor performance in school, you get fewer years of um, schooling completed, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, what, what we hadn't linked it to earlier is the fact that in the first thousand days of life, your, all the brain cells you will have in your life are created. Now, as you grow older, neural 
networks are, are become more operative and, and change become more complex. But you have your basic, basic supply of brain cells by your second birthday. Um, and after that, there's no, there's no, you're not creating anymore. So that is in part what underlies this poor uh, educational and economic performance for the rest of your life. You, have a, you face a severe, severe handicap. Um, this leakiness in the gut causes an immune system response. Remember, these are toxins. So your body uh, mounts an immune system response, which in the young child uses more of these uh, precious growth resources. So you have the obvious physical stunting and the less obvious mental stunting. Um, just to show you what this, the growth curves look like, the blue, the red is, uh, this is Gambian data, the red is, the, is weight gain, uh, not height gain, and the blue is the, the lactose mannitol ratio. So it's a mirror image as that, as that sugar leakage test goes down and then growth goes up. Um, okay, how, how do we tackle this in an attempt to create greater inclusivity in, in growth? Well, typically different professions have approached the problem from, from their own narrow perspectives. Um, food programs, for example, uh, I reviewed 42 different feeding programs um, attempting to deal with this. You have an average growth deficit um, in, among African and Asian children of minus, minus two standard deviations. The best feeding programs um, achieve about one-third uh, recovery from, from that growth deficit. So there's some catch-up, but it's far from complete. Uh, the medics have tended to approach it from a disease control um, perspective, and particularly have focused on diarrhea as the, as the leading cause of, of child death. But the interventions that, that have tackled diarrhea produce no change in linear growth in, in children. They, they do reduce mortality rates, but they don't change the growth outcomes. Um, sanit combined sanitation and hygiene interventions, uh, even with almost universal coverage, uh, reduce diarrhea by 30%, but under nutrition only by uh, less than 3%. Um, combined water sanitation and hygiene interventions um, give you approximately the same degree of improvement as dietary interventions. Um, so the, the, the medical literature has, using diarrhea as a, as a principal cause, has tended to um, underestimate the contribution of um, hygiene to the problem. Uh, then I just summarized some of the Gambian data, which is where the, the best combination of, of medical research and um, social science research has been done. Um, and again, diarrhea, solving the diarrhea problem does not solve the, the undernutrition problem. Um, there is, I suggest, no easy way out of this. Um, it, it, what is required is one of the most difficult things in development work, and that is uh, profound behavioral changes. Um, one is basic just basic household level hygiene practices, such as hand washing, the availability of, of soap. Um, child rearing behavior is, is another one. Um, if, you ask, if you ask me what might work best uh, for children, for mothers in Africa, would be play pins. Um, this play pins isolate the child from the environment and let the mother get on with what she has to do without endangering the child's health. But there's a whole set of, of issues uh, around child rearing behavior and maternal time management. One of the things that's quite striking in, in my panel is that because these households were given additional land, there was uh, created at the same time an additional demand for agricultural labor. So women's labor in field work became much more valuable and they were taken away from domestic uh, responsibilities. Infants were left in the care of siblings um, and weren't particularly well looked after. High density weaning foods can be, can be critical in that first, uh, first two years of life. 
there's not a lot of um, evidence so far that, that points in that direction. Safe water supplies, domestic toilets, and livestock management practices. Um, livestock management basically means you keep your chickens and goats um, out of the domestic living area and put them someplace else. Um, so what I find is a long-term secular change in decline in nutritional status in Zimbabwe. The norm is a household with well-nourished adults and undernourished children, at least one undernourished child. Um, I've pointed out the contradict. The paper goes into much more detail about the association between nutritional status and a whole set of economic indicators, um, which I worked on for a long time and very with very frustrating outcomes. Um, something I'm just beginning to look, on, look at is the distribution of nutritional outcomes because I suspect that they are not randomly distributed, um, that there are other things going on. Um, and I can't, well, despite looking, first couple of rounds of looking at association between nutritional outcomes and factors that predispose to environmental enteropathy. I haven't got very far with it. And then finally, on back to the theme of the conference, a child who experiences environmental enteropathy in the first two years of its life cannot benefit from inclusive growth. That by definition, it's, uh, uh, they, the, there is no catch up and inclusive growth is not going to, to benefit these, these children. Um, and I leave with a, a set of questions, uh, the most important of which I think is, is perhaps the third one, um, and that is the perspective on, of, of different people working in development on issues such as food security. I mean, the basic, the bottom line here is we are not what we eat. A nutritionally adequate diet does not lead to satisfactory growth of young children. Um, on, in these conditions. So um, increasing agricultural productivity, um, food aid, a whole set of, of common interventions are not really going to help with this particular problem. Um, and at that point, I, I will leave it. Sorry to be so gloomy. <laughs>